I'm not sure which lesson we're in. Am I allowed? That's, that's the nature of the beast here. And I got more stories to tell. I'll try to, I'll try to be focused. But Every week brings its new level of just curiosity in the United States of America. <laughs> I am sure that someone asked me if that curiosity is lunacy. I don't even have to question, is it lunacy? Yeah, there's, there's so much lunacy going around, it's not even funny. But we'll try to stay... We'll try to stay focused. Lesson number five, you need a, if you're following the lesson book, James chapter two, the beginning of that. As always, pray for a nation, lots of things going on around. Again, somebody mentioned the, the collapse of a building in, in Florida, which is just horrible. That would be, I, I can't think I'll walk into a building. I, I was in a hotel, hotel. Yeah, I mean, that's just awful. I, while they're sleeping, it's exactly, I mean, I stayed in a, I was in a hotel this weekend in the D.C. area, 8th floor, I don't think about it collapsing, that would be certainly problematic. As well as certainly pray for the situations in Israel, change of governments, pray for our nation for lots of reasons. James chapter 2, the, the lesson's called Respectful Faith, because because we as people are, are kind of funny people. Is, it, is this my fourth or is that my fourth? So I'm just wearing this just for show. It's a placebo, is that what it is? Can, can you hear me now? Whoa, man. Oh, I am your father. Anyhow, we'll quit that. Enough of that. Let's turn this off. There's no need to burn a battery. Anyhow, so James, this is going to be hard. Do you have like a leash or something or like shackles I could put something on? I'm not used to that. James chapter 2, again, some, some challenging verses and some that get taken out of context, but, but some powerful truth. James chapter 2, verse number 1, that says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. And it is difficult for us as people not to be prejudiced against folks. And I'm, and I'm talking about prejudice being something that comes because of who people are, not because of what they do. How many folks are prejudiced against a person that cuts you off on the highway? I consider it a blessing. It gives me a chance to exercise my auto insurance, right? I mean, I, I, got to, I was in the D.C., again, driving from the D.C. area, which is always a placid time. We were driving... Um, Rachel lives across town from where we stayed, and so Roseanne was with me, and she enjoys, she enjoys the traffic of, how many folks crochet are they, where you weave in and out? Does anybody do that? Does anybody knit or anything at cross stitch where you have to weave in and out of stuff? Well, I do that on the highway in D.C. You ought to drive in D.C. It's, it's great during rush hour traffic. It is a wonderful place. I'm not, I've, I figured out why most, most D.C. cars look like they've been banged up, because they have been. So again, I'm not talking about something somebody does and says, hey, I don't appreciate that. Um, but prejudice, on, on the first slide especially, we'll talk about some just characteristics of folks and say, hey, are we prejudiced against those things? And again, we, we tend to have, the, again, some, some levels of those. And here in America, boy, we're making it so divisive. I mean, I've, 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 I was in the Pentagon two weeks ago and walked up to, I, I have this crazy habit in the Pentagon of just nodding my head at people, eye contact, and it is, I, I, must, I must have like the black plague on my forehead. Right, so duck the head. But there was this young one gentleman whose skin color appeared to be significantly darker than mine, that I saw he smiled and I smiled at him. I said, hey, I said, wait a minute. You, you and I ought to hate each other. Man, you're a black guy and I'm a white guy. I'm a country guy and you're a city guy. What's the problem here? And he just smiled and grinned. He was taking his Dunkin' Donuts to his workmates. And it's just amazing how prejudice gets created. And again, we live in a society, our world, we are, the media will pump you full of prejudice against things, both, and, and, and sadly, the, the world has tried to blur between this is the way we are versus choices we make. You know, I, I am a white male because I was born that way. If I choose to be a bitter, angry white male, just love me because I'm bitter and angry. And that's not the way I was born. I am a born a sinner. But bitter and angry are not the areas that I have a joy to say, well, you shouldn't be prejudiced against me being bitter. How many folks love bitter, angry people? How many folks are bitter, angry people? How many folks live with... No, anyhow, I'm getting in trouble. Um, we're going to get in the lesson again, and so... As especially the first lie will be controversial in today's America. I mean, it, it, is, it is disturbing that, that we are being labeled as, as political by just merely preaching Bible. I mean, I understand I've read it, and I believe this to be true because it, it, it appeared to be more than just truth on the Internet, where a group that was appealing for uh, tax-free status was accused of being political because a particular political party, I'll let you guess which one, embraced the values that they seem to teach. Embrace the values of against abortion. Embrace the values of for righteousness and for and sin being sin. I, 
I'm not being political. I'm just being, trying to be Bible here. I mean, our politics should, our politics, frankly, should match up with truth, should match up with Bible principles. But before we get in the, word, in the, in the lesson, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll get in the lesson. Our right, Lord and our God, we love you. We need you. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you're better than our mic systems. We don't know what the challenge is. Um, Lord, we thank you that you're better than the weather, which outside is just absolutely gorgeous, a beautiful, sunny day. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you're better than our government that's inconsistent. And Lord, we thank you that you're better than us who, who struggle uh, with self, who struggle with pride, who struggle with, uh, with ego, uh, with selfishness, with laziness. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ who gives us hope, who gives us purpose. Lord, we pray to help us to seek and to serve you. We pray for your, your Holy Spirit to have liberty in this place. Uh, Lord, whether it's a beautiful June uh, sun, summer day or, Lord, whether it's uh, snowing uh, to beat the band with wind chills that are below zero, we thank you that you're God uh, desiring uh, to save the lost, uh, to encourage the saved. Lord, so we pray for there's one here that needs Christ, whether in the room, around the building, or even online, that, that today would be the day of salvation. Uh, Lord, we pray for Christians that you'd fitly frame the messages, Lord, whether in the Sunday school hour as well as in the preaching hour, uh, that you'd rebuke, uh, encourage, challenge, bless. Uh, Lord, help us to be obedient to you, to be obedient to your Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, as, as you seek to guide us through him uh, as he applies the truth of, of your word. Lord, we thank you for your son who gave his life for us. Lord, help us to honor you. Bless, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So first page. Again, when, when it comes to, to prejudice, we're going to talk about the principles of prejudice. And again, it starts with verse number one of, of the, what we just read. That this, It's all based on characteristics. And again, in the room here, we have lots of different ways we could be prejudiced against folks, right? I mean, there's, there's some folks that would appear to be male, some appear to be female, and the other things we'll talk about as we go through the slide. I, I've made a statement in, in seriousness that sounds kind of jesting. I am against anybody Jesus is against. So if Jesus didn't die for you, I'm, I'm probably not a, I'm not probably, I'm not a fan. So if you can find those people that Jesus didn't die for, you let me know, and I will, I will really not like them. I'm not a fan of Satan. Because he's a deceiver, a liar, a cheater, and anything he's trying to do is destructive. He is, he is spiritual cancer. He's trying to destroy everything he touches. Next time. So, so we'll start with the first prejudice. Starts with ethnic prejudice. And, and again, it's, all of these things are present today in America. It is, it, and, but they're all present in Bible. They were going to go to Bible places, and I'm only picking one example for each of these. In John chapter 4, verse number 9, Jesus is with this woman at a well. And Jesus makes a simple request. Hey, give me something to drink. Four, four words. Give me to drink. And what's the woman's response? Does she ask him, hey, do you want to die, Dr. Pepper? No. Do you want, what's her first, her response isn't anything. Her response is, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which is a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. It didn't have anything to do with her. If she was tall, short, fat, thin, old, young, 20 kids, two kids, no kids, married, unmarried, he said, you shouldn't like me because I'm a Samaritan. A pure, I mean, again, the Jews and the Samaritans, you go back through the history of that, the Samaritans were considered half-breeds. I mean, they just didn't fit in. They weren't Jews. They weren't non-Jews. It was, again, the history of them is, is interesting. I encourage you to go through that to find out that. Do we have ethnic prejudice in America today? There's two yeses. Okay. I, I, I think we do. We, man, I just, I just don't like you because your background. I mean, I remember as a kid, they used to talk about Polish people. There was a certain kind of joke, and they never called them Polish jokes, right? I, anybody ever heard of a Polish joke called by a different term? Why do we pick on Polish people? And the Polish jokes were never one to say, did you hear about the Polish scientist who invented a cure for cancer? And it's all, it wasn't always about the Polish person who was just dumber than a rock, right? I mean, it's the, did you hear about the Polish person that died in his convertible in a rainstorm? Because the keys got locked in the car? I mean, it's just like, what? We make fun of it, and again, if, if we don't like people because of their background, God's got a pretty simple principle there. Shame on us. But we continue on. Next item. So ethnic prejudice, which is different than racial prejudice. And, and I'm, I, I'm with you. When someone says, how many races? There's one race. a human race. From what I can tell from what the Bible has to say, if I believe the Bible to be true, and I do, is we all came from the same place. But we talk about, I mean, even Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. So if, if you don't like people that are, and boy, in today's America, oh, forbid you ever say anything about any. You know, let's, let's not call, when I was a child, you could call, I, I think the word Negro was okay. A black person was okay. I'm not sure what the right term is today. Yellow person, red person. And now it's, we got to be sensitive. Uh, and again, I, and I'm with my dad. My, my late father was like this. He, he got sick of everything being a hyphenated American. 
I'm not an Italian American or an English American or a Chinese American. I'm an American. I'm an American. You're an America. Speak American. Anyhow, um, but, but racial prejudice is certainly found in the scripture, and this isn't against a trivial thing. Numbers chapter 12, verse number 1, And Miriam and Aaron spoke, spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. I get the hint that the Ethiopian woman was born. I'm not, anybody been to Ethiopia? I've never been to Ethiopia, but my impression, when, when you heard the word Ethiopian woman, what did she look like? Did she look like a blonde-haired, fair-skinned young lady? Did anybody think of that? Of course, Ethiopia is known for its fair, fair-skinned, blonde hair, which would probably die because of the sun in Ethiopia. An Ethiopian woman is probably a black woman. And Moses, you're, you're, not, you're, you're not even pure white. You're dark. I mean, I love the fact white. What is white? We walk around the room here. There's some people that are pale. I got Italian blood in my, so my, my skin tends to darken up. We, we can run all over the place. But we live in America where white against black. I mean, black lives matter. Yeah, black lives matter. And white lives matter. And all the lives matter. And if I say all lives matter, I'm offensive to black lives matter because black. And it's, it goes on and on and on. And it's easy. Around, look around the room here. Does anybody see any black folk in this room? You might say, man, what are you talking about? We, we tend to be a bunch of white folk in this room. I mean, a black person walking in this room is probably not going to say to be the most. You should look around and say, I, I don't see anybody like me. And I can say that openly because I've been in predominantly black churches when I go to D.C. Back in the day when you could actually go to churches. Um, remember those good days when you could actually go places and you could stand for a man? It was kind of fun back in the good old days. I mean, I've been in church. I, I remember going to a, the first time I was in a black church was in Richmond, Virginia. And, man, this big this guy that looked like he could have played linebacker for the, for the Steelers comes up and hugs me. Another guy shakes my hand wants to know if I'm saved. I didn't even walk in the door. And I said, I appreciate that because I clearly stuck out as, as the white guy. I think there was, I was at, one, at, a, at a seminar they were doing one time where this guy was just laying out young black men. He was like, you guys getting these girls pregnant and not being responsible. And he was just giving them what for. And I think I was one of three white people in a room of about 400 people. It's shame on us if we don't like people because of, their, of, of the color of their skin. But that's where we live. And again, I'll be honest with you. I've stood in the foyer of our, of our church here and heard folks use words that get you in trouble if you were a politician using them. And, and frankly, it would get you in trouble if you were my child using them because just to make fun of people's color skin. And does it work both ways? Absolutely. You can find a black folks that don't like white folks, white folks that don't like black folks. Yeah, I mean, this whole... The, the lunacy of the last year, the China virus. Let's go beat up. The, let's go beat up somebody that looks like they're Asian. And again, we, we live in a world where people can't tell Koreans apart from Vietnamese, from Chinese, from Japanese. We can have naivete that says we think they're all alike. The Chinese don't like the Japanese normally. They're, they're not the best of friends. If you think Chinese Taipei is in love with mainland China, not the case. But let's make sure we don't. Again, and the racial there's all kind of tests of these things. Would you would you want your neighbor? to have this. I mean, there's some folks say, I don't want those people moving to my neighborhood. Why is that? Did, did they not pay their bills? Did they, did they do something? It's a challenging examination of us individually. Say, hey, which, which of these prejudices do we have? And I, 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 gotta, I gotta keep moving because I could camp on any of these. That they are problematic. If we have prejudice in these areas, shame on us, on, on anything we put up on the screen here. Next slide. Age prejudice. Them young people, back when I was a boy, you, hey, how many folks testify back when I was a boy, you used to have to work for a living? This video game, lazy, no good, nothing. Who's with me on that one? Amen. Do I have an amen from some old people? Amen. I was on the farm. I didn't do nothing but work. I worked 26 hours a day. I didn't sleep at all. And I was lucky to get fed once a year. But I did. How many folks know old people like that with young people? You know, account, good for nothing, lazy bums. Well, the Bible has it, 1 Timothy 4.12. Let no man despise thy youth. Why did Paul say that to Timothy? Because there are people despising his youth. You know what? I don't, I don't care if you're six years old, 66 years old, or 666 years old. Well, I do care if you're 666 years old. God, be shake your hand how you did it. Um, but if I don't like somebody because of their age, shame on me. But we, we live in a culture where there's those kind of divisions. Old people not liking young people, young people not trusting old people. You guys don't understand. You guys are fuddy-duddies. You know? Bear with me if I don't care what kind of camera I have on my phone. Again, it tends to, it, it tends to be this way, but it is certainly an oversimplification. Uh, younger people tend to be more sophisticated with electronics. You know, if, if, if you want somebody to go set up your, your, I was gonna say VCR, but I am a relic now. If you want somebody to set up your television system and you get a choice between Ryan, my son, and me, don't call me. 
I'm still looking for where the red and green and, and, and yellow plug plug into the back so I can play Pong. HDMI cable, I mean, there's all, what, what are we talking about? But frankly, that has nothing to do with youth. That just has a, a, something to do with preference. And again, we, we tend to do that. Be careful that we diminish young people. I, again, I get jaded by folks that want to be, these young people in this generation don't want to do nothing. Well, no, are there some lazy young people? Absolutely. I know some lazy old people. I know some lazy middle-aged people. So let's not pick on ages. Hey, we ought to be an encouragement at all stages. In fact, the Bible tells us is we ought to encourage younger folks. If you're an older folk, encourage younger folks. Next slide. I don't even know how to deal with this one in America. There used, I remember the day when if you had a form that asked you what gender you were, there were two choices, male and female. But again, it, it's, I do surveys often, and it is rare to find a survey that only asks you those two choices. I'll get male, female, gender fluid, pangent. And there are so many, it, it is again, if you want to do, a, I'd encourage you to do an understanding of gender, not because it'll disgust you, but because it is just incredible. There is, there's probably no limit to the genders. I mean, you could be gender fluid. And again, I taught a lesson on last, last summer on this that's, a, again, a head shaker. But the Bible's real clear. There's two choices, male and female. And the Bible has situations where I'm against either one of them. Exodus 1.16, the situation in Egypt when the, the Israelites would give birth. Pharaoh had, had declared the king of Egypt, as he's called, they're also Pharaoh, also known as Pharaoh. Exodus 1.16 said, And he said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then shall ye kill him. But if it be a daughter, then shall she live. So for no other reason, I want to kill this child solely because he's a male. Wow. Wow. Not because of he's old, he's young, he's tall, he's fat, he's short. Three pounds, six pounds, 20 pounds, 100 pounds at birth. We don't care what he weighs, how long he is. We don't care anything about him. Kill him because he's a male. And you might say, well, that's, that's unfair. Well, that's okay. We're going to get to the woman part too. Judges chapter 9, you talk about male ego. Abimelech. Abimelech was one of the most curious judges of the book of Judges. He's, he was a piece of work. Um, Abimelech, kind of a different approach. But in the end of, at the end of Judges chapter 9, Abimelech meets his demise. And it says, And a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head and all to break his skull. The visual of that is not pleasant. Does anybody have a millstone at your house? Does anybody have a mill where you, you grind your own grain? I mean, Roseanne and I have one in the backyard. We, we have the water wheel and we have the oxen. <laughs> no, we don't. Anyhow, a millstone would have been a pretty big rock. So it's not only am I impressed about the big rock, hey, somebody picked it up. I don't care if you're a woman or a man. It's pretty impressive. A piece of a millstone big enough to break his skull. But in verse 54, it says, Then he called hastily unto the young man his armor bearer and said to him, Draw thy sword and slay me. I love this next part. That men say not of me, a woman slew him. I am about to die, and the biggest problem I got is, oh, oh, they're going to know that a woman killed me. You know what, Abimelech? There was no Facebook to post that. Wolf Blitzer of CNN was not, Abimelech, uh, news, news here, Abimelech dies, woman smashes his head, and we've got the testimony. <laughs> What's the situation? Hey, it's a woman killed me. Can't let some woman kill me. And boy, gender prejudice shows up all over the place. I mean, we've lived, again, you don't, you don't have to be very old. Yeah. But even to go back years, women's rights. Am I for women's rights? Absolutely. I think a woman should have a right to do lots of things. I think men should have rights. I'm okay with people having rights. I mean, this, this whole thing of, I, I love the statement of we need to be equal. I am not a smart person. I do not want to be equal with a woman. I don't want to get pregnant. I don't want to give birth. I passed. From what I saw of what Roseanne went through and others, I've seen, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. Doesn't look like a lot of fun. I've never seen anybody or heard testimony of giving birth. Man, this is great, man. We're going to Disney. What are you going to do at Disney? I'm going to ride the pregnancy ride. It's going to be great. It's going to last nine months and the ending's unbelievable. Um, and I say that to Jess, but we live in a world that is attacking gender. Not only gender prejudice, but just gender in general. Where it's not just male, female. I, again, I read it. I'm a... In a world where I can't think I read more lunatic articles, I read a lunatic article to, even this morning where this biologist doesn't want to even gender mark animals because if we gender mark animals, gender mark them, if we, if we figure out gender mark, and, and some of the, the laughable part, I didn't gender mark my dog, but when she was in heat, she, she, she ended up having babies. Um, we're living in a world that's trying to degender all kinds of things. I mean, it happened last year, Target department store, big, big kerfuffle about you know, we're not going to have toys. And again, you go to many stores and there's not boys' toys, girls' toys. There are toys. 
The degendering of America disturbs me greatly because it's, a, it's an attack upon God himself. Because in creation, I mean, the creation situation gets attacked because of its, its attack against evolution, where evolution thinks it's right. But what's the first thing God says about human beings is male and female, made he them, created he them. And so if that's not the case, then apparently this book is clearly wrong. And again, I could, we could go off on that one. But if you don't like people because they're women, I mean, it's one of those, anybody ever heard about people complaining, oh, women driver? Do any women complain about women drivers, or is it just uh, those of us to use the, the, the men's room? Do women complain about men drivers? Stupid man drivers. Women, you ladies, do you guys complain about men drivers? Or do you just complain about stupid drivers? Who predominantly tend to be men. Uh, so, anyhow, we pick on all kinds of things. And are there differences? Absolutely. Again, pastors preach some messages on that. It's a great study to have the differences in gender. And it ought to be an appreciation, not an attack. Next item. And so gender prejudice. Leadership prejudice. You might say, what's that one about? Well, let me give you this test. I don't, this is not political, but how many people in the room have the same level of respect for Joe Biden that you had for Donald Trump? Okay. Or let's even make it better. You might say, I didn't like either of them, or I love both of them, which if you love both of them, let me know. I'd love to shake your hand. Um, let me put all these men in the same place. You have the same level of respect for George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, Richard Nixon, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden. If you have the same level of respect for all six of those, you may be in the point zero 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 one percent of humans, because most folks have a pretty substantially high high belief set about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. And my impression of understanding of people who appreciate either the the last two presidents, President Biden or President Trump, is not quite the same. You know, I, I disagree with policies of pretty much any president I've ever lived under, and certainly the current administration, I pray for them because the policies just get to be unbelievable. Not a political statement, but just a fact we could deal with Bible principles there. Um, but it happens in the Bible. First Corinthians chapter 1, we're talking about Bible place. This is preaching. First Corinthians 1, 12. Now this I say that every one of you that saith, I'm a Paul, and I'm a Paulus, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. I'm a Paul lover, I'm an Apollos. Apollos was another preacher, Cephas, another name for Peter, and of course Jesus. People pick sides of what preacher they liked. And you might say, how silly is that? I'm just, going, I'm just going to be honest with you. When Pastor Mattis preaches, there's a, or somebody's taking his place, some people don't show up because of who's preaching. And shame on us. Shame on me. I, I, I've, I've heard in, 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 in this pulpit something preach serious. There was a guy, it's been years ago, and it was like, please, please, can I pull the words out of your mouth? A gentleman who stuttered horribly. So what do I do? Ah, man, I ain't no good preacher. I'll just be honest. Hey, Sam Davison's preaching. Oh, man, we're going to be here for an hour and a half. Man, give me Jerry Savinsky, 20 minutes and done. He's, I mean, he's like Domino's Pizza, man. Boom, 30 minutes or less, and we're done. We're out of here. We're like, I've heard people say that. I like this person's preaching. Why? Because they go too long. <laughs> What's the right amount of time to go? When God tells you you're done, Paul preached all night in the Bible. Well, I can't go. That guy's preaching. He's too long way. Have you ever heard somebody called a long-winded preacher? Well, you know what that's called? Well, it could be, but I've never heard anybody called long-winded that they said that was a blessing. I, they, they went on so long. I fell asleep twice, but that was such a blessing. I got a little nap in, got a little rest. Let's. Oh, you're exactly right. But it's, again, leadership principles ought to be whoever, again, our pastor's in charge here, whoever pastors believe should be behind the pulpit, hey, we should support. And again, you might say, hey, if I've got a Bible, yeah, if you've got a Bible reason, you know, pastor invites somebody who's, you know, going to teach us how great the Muslims are, well, then, yeah, we got a challenge. Gotcha. But leadership prejudice is a problem, and it shows up in churches like ours. Next item. I hope to get through this page in the lesson. Geographic prejudice. What are we talking about now? I've experienced this personally. John 1, 46, Nathaniel. You got to love the disciples. They were just human beings. So Jesus is calling the disciples. He, he, finds, he finds Philip and Beth, Philip of Bethsaida, which was Andrew and Peter's city. And Philip finds Nathaniel, and he says to Nathaniel, Philip's excited in, Mar, in John 1, 45, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. I get excited over ball games. I get excited over lots of things. He was, this is the Messiah that's been promised from the beginning. We found him, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel, like a good young man, pours water on that guy's hot fire. 
Because Nathaniel's first statement isn't great, let's go talk to him, great, let's go hear him. His statement is, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Are you serious? Are you serious? What? He was prejudiced against the city. And if you don't think that, I, I can remember when I used to work at the gas company a lot of years ago. Someone asked me where I lived. I lived in Northview. You live in Northview? Why do you live there? Ooh. <laughs> when I went to school, I, I don't know if anybody, is, did, anybody not, did anybody not go to Bridgeport but went to Clarksburg schools? My understanding, the, the Clarksburg schools and the Bridgeport schools, they were like thick as thieves. They loved each other, right? Everybody loved. I know it's probably not the way today. I was going to say, it's, <laughs> well, it's because you're Hicks. I ain't got time for that. Somebody talk about South Harrison. But it tends to be the nature, and it's not just here, obviously. My, I, I've not lived in Wood County, but my understanding, Parkersburg South and Parkersburg are not fans of each other. East Fairmont and West Fairmont, Morgantown and University High. But I'm picking a fight here. I <laughs> Anyhow, they call them rivalries. If you don't, I mean, geographic prejudice. If, if, the, if the WVU Mountaineers play the Pitt Panthers in anything, I think if there's a Tiddlywinks tournament, somebody's going to wear vulgar shirts that just are, because we don't like each other. I've been in meetings. I've told that story before. I was in a meeting one time where someone, I said I stayed in Crestview, and a guy said, oh, Crest, we call that Crest, Virginia, because it's kind of, you know, shaky. I said, that's, that's funny, sir. I live in West Virginia. Living in West Virginia gets a bad reputation. So geographic prejudice is not changed. Alive and well. You live in that place? What are you doing? You know what I found out? Jesus Christ died for people that live in, in ghettos just as much as he died for people that live in mansions. Jesus Christ died for people that live in New York City, which is kind of a nice place, I guess, if you like that, as much as he does the backwoods of Harlan County, Kentucky. Jesus Christ died for people that live in trailers. Jesus Christ died for people that live in mansions. Jesus Christ died for people that are driving beat-up 1970 four-cylinder cars that are barely making it, as much as he died for people that live in, or that drive, you know, Cadillac SUVs. Next time, i got to continue. I, th I think there's one more here, if I remember right. Yeah, social status. Now we start getting into to position and money, which again, geographic often connotes that. You know, we as, we as West Virginians in, in the major press get beat on politically because we're backwards, backward people. Um, we, get, we get made fun of as being the, the gun-toting religious people that are just against everything. Um, Matthew chapter 9, Jesus sat down with publicans and sinners. And the Pharisees, the Jewish religious people, one, one sect of the Jewish religious, they said, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? What are you doing? What are you doing with those people? And I've, I've been in this church. It's been a while. I still remember somebody coming in one time. You didn't have to see him. You smelled him before you saw him. Horrible body odor. Just awful. Just terrible. I mean, there's some people that have come to this church that just lived in, in awful places. I can remember going to a house one time picking up bus kids where I thought it was an orange carpet, but the Cheetos that were on the floor all over the place really weren't carpet because the roaches or whatever the creatures were underneath it that were eating them were moving around. I've been in people's houses. Um, Roseanne will know this story where someone had a turkey inside their house on a couch and doing what turkeys do, sitting on top of the couch, behind the couch. There was times Roseanne, Roseanne, back in the day when Roseanne was pregnant, I'm getting ready to give birth to Jason. She had to leave somebody's house. It smelled so bad. And you know what? Jesus died for all those folks. I have knocked doors in houses that are enormous and been told but to my face, what do I need Jesus for? And you know what? I need to love both those folks. The complete fool that thinks they've got... And again, around this room, we would have people who are well off and we'd have some people who are not well off. My social status have nothing to do you know, I, when you walk in the door, we don't give you a little form that says, how much money, what's your income, so we can figure out where we're going to have you. So again, lots of prejudice issues, and you might say, boy, we're going to get into James. Yeah, because that's the foundation of James. James chapter 2 is, if you're praised against any of these things, and, and the last one on riches is specifically what James calls out. If you're praised on any of these things, shame on us. If any of those categories you think, man, I really don't like a person because they fit some category that's on that list, hey, we need to get right. Because Jesus died for all of those categories. None of those have anything to do with sin. Again, did Jesus hate sin? Absolutely. None of those things are sin categories. Next page. We're good. And so I'll move through this a little quicker. Um, so attitude toward others is important, and the faith of Christ is the example of that. And I'm not going to turn to all those passages there, but if you go to John chapter 4, we were already there once with the woman at the well, who is a Samaritan woman. We're going to find some situations where he deals with, with publicans and sinners. Jesus didn't care who you were. 
Jesus wanted you to get right. Jesus didn't care. The centurion of John chapter 4, he's a, he's a government official that's in the way. Why am I going to... And the Romans weren't... The centurion, the, he honored his faith in John, the end of John chapter 4, verses 46 to 53. You're, you're beating us up. You're making us do things we don't want to do. Jesus Christ kept reaching out to people. And we need to do the same. And, and I'm with you. It is far easier to deal with people that are like us. That's the way we are as human beings. I mean, the reason we get together in church is, again, we have a diverse group of people when it comes to backgrounds and jobs and, and how you were raised. Some people raised in church, some people not raised in church. Some people, um, again, are, are far different music styles. They like whatever else. It's where we got to be careful. Hey, what, do we go beat on each other? Again, for non-sin issues. I'm not talking about sin issues. I'm not here to say, yeah, yeah. You're a liar and I'm a cheater. You're a drunk and I'm a dope addict. Hey, let's all get along. Well, that's, that's not what we're talking about. It becomes issues that are just matters of choices. And again, none of those things, the four groups that Jesus dealt with in those four passages, were matters of sin and non-sin. In fact, Jesus Christ is reaching out to sinners, which we need to do so. How, we're trying to reach the lost. By definition, those are folks that need the Savior that are going to live in sinful behaviors. Next time. So Christ's example, the next, next point. When it says with, with respect of persons is to have no partiality, and again, lots of verses that deal with that. For time's sake, I'm not going to read all of those, but the, the two principles of Proverbs are not shocking. Proverbs 24, 23, that says, These things also belong unto the wise. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. And what does that mean? Uh, again, it's, it's disturbing situations where folks, I've, I've seen this in religious circles, I'm against sin until one of my family members are guilty of that sin, and that's really not as bad as I thought it was. I mean, there's a major political candidate that had taken a stand pretty seriously against homosexuality. And then it came out that his son was a homosexual, and so he backed off that stand. You know, it shouldn't make any difference. It does. It shouldn't make any difference if Joe Biden is driving under the influence, or if some poor person is driving under the influence. Hey, truth is truth. Judgment is judgment. We, but do we do that? And the hardest folks to do that with is family. Now I've seen both sides. I've seen people who are just hammer the family and are less lenient on others. And then the other side, hey, if my family did it, i got to go defend that behavior. Neither of those is acceptable. I mean, how's, how's Jesus going to deal with us? we got folks here from Texas. Well, they get, a, they get a, you know, Texas doesn't have, there's no income tax in Texas, right? Well, they get a benefit then. Man, let's treat them better. they got more money to spend, right? They give us more money because we got to pay income tax here in West Virginia. Those poor saps. Um, no, it doesn't matter. When somebody comes up and they want to get saved, I'm going to say, well, how much money do you make? Because if you're a good tither, I got you. But if you're not, you know, somebody else can deal with you. I don't really even care. What? What? And again, I've, I've heard people in this church say, you know what? we got way too many Mexicans in this area. They need to go back home. You know what I need to do with a Mexican? If they're here illegally, absolutely, they should go back home. That's right. Illegal, I'm, I'm not for illegal immigration. Absolutely against it. I think it's, the word illegal kind of the tip off there. If it's illegal, don't do it. But we need Mexicans to get saved because I learned something a few days ago. Jesus died for Mexicans. It was amazing. In fact, he died for them like he died for me. He can even speak Spanish to them. That's what's kind of cool. Proverbs 28, 21. I, I could get off track here. I, there's some, some of this I get passionate about. Um, Proverbs 28, 21, same kind of principle. To have respect of persons is not good, for for a piece of bread that man will transgress. And it's called that, well, I'll, if, if you can do something for me, I'll forgive that. It was, it was funny one time in a church service, in a Sunday morning church service, in this very room, somebody stood up, I appreciate so-and-so because he fixed my ticket. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I would be glad to not have to pay a ticket, but if I'm sitting here thinking, okay, I did that for you because of that, 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 that could be problematic. Be fair in dealing. And again, take out a Bible approach is the way to go. Next out, if we could. So no partiality. And... For some reason, he starts talking about clothing. You might say, how do we get to clothing in a judgment situation? Well, he talks about the, the, the example that James uses is a clothing example. For they're coming into your, a, a, if they're coming to your assembly, a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and they're coming also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, sit thou here in a good place, or say unto the poor, stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Verse 4 says, are you not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Clothing sends messages, and I'm not here to preach a lesson on, on clothes per se, but there are all kind of labels put to clothing. Genesis 38, 14 talks about the widow's garment that sadly 
were being used to deceive Judah in a horrible situation in, in Genesis chapter 38. Uh, Exodus, Exodus 28, I believe, talked about holy garments. If I remember right, those are the garments that, that Aaron was going to put on as the priest. Yeah, holy garments were the, were the word there. And you're going to find, again, different... Def, uh, Jeremiah 52 talks about prison garments. And so what's the, what's the deal with, with, with clothing? Should, should it matter? Been here, done that. When I go fly, I would encourage you, you dress like this when you go somewhere. And for those that are online, it's a tie, and it's not necessarily the color of the tie or stuff. You wear a tie and you walk around places, you can get treated differently. Does a tie make you any better? No. Does it make you any smarter? No. Does it make you any richer? No. None of it. But you get treated different. And it is, it is a sad situation where there's some example. There was a situation, I remember reading about a church that had called a new pastor, and so this new pastor decided to come to church kind of scraggly and not fancy and was treated pretty poorly. And then when they announced he was the pastor, he walks on stage. Oh, it was a little different. I, I've heard testimony of, again, when it, this is kind of an, an ethnic situation of how you appear that when there's, again, a predominantly black church that, that I'm familiar with, uh, when people come from that church and just show up, they get treated differently than if they show up and let people know they're from that church. I'm not be that way. You know, if, if, if we're going to look, look over somebody, it, it used to be the joke about Everybody goes to church on Easter saying, show off their Easter stuff. I don't know if they still do that, Easter clothes. Um, I'm, I'm too cheap. I just, whatever, dark suit, white shirt, red tie, works for me. But if somebody's looking at us about, hey, here's, sends the message of you, you go here, you go there. And we're not talking about decency when it comes to this. I mean, that's, that's a totally different lesson. But we ought not judge somebody's, uh, we'll, we'll, I, I'll use the American euphemism. The way somebody drives up in their vehicle ought not be the judge of how we treat them. You know, if somebody's driving in the, in the car that's certainly got some problem, you know, pistons are missing versus the car that looks like it just came off the show. I mean, if you're driving up in the Lamborghini, I'm your buddy. But if you're driving up in the, in the beat-up Chevette or Yugo or something, something's wrong. Let's not be that way. Ask God, God, what do you want me to do to be a blessing to buddy? And I don't care how you dress, how you look, how you smell. Next item. And God's a big fan of poor folks. And it's hard in America to be poor. Just because America, we are so blessed in America. I mean, one of the, the statements is, and the folks that are, one of the assertions being made in current day America, I've seen some numbers of how much money you can make for not working in America. And it's just staggering. It is just baffling. I mean, it's, and, it, and certainly the challenge of there's lots of jobs available and folks aren't filling them, but that's, I'm not here to preach politics, but though I'd love to do though. Um, James chapter 2, verse 4 says, Are you not then partial on yourselves or become judges of evil thought? Verse 5, hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? And the verses, again, for time's sake, I'm not going to read all those verses other than Proverbs 14, 20. All those verses, God cares about poor folks. In fact, he even makes the statement, the poor is going to be with you all. Jesus made that statement. The poor are with you always. So what are we doing to treat poor folks? You know what? It, it, it's a great example for poor folks. A poor person isn't going to be able to do something for me monetarily. I need to go help that person. And it's a sad statement in Proverbs chapter 14 about poor and rich. The poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich hath many friends. If my attitude about people is based on their stuff, that's problematic. And again, I realize there's issues all over the place when it comes to money that drives things. We ought not have an attitude about poor people. We ought to have God's attitude about poor people. One other place I'll go to is, for time's sake, is... Um, Psalm 82, Psalm 82, verses 3 and 4. In my Bible, Psalm 82 is titled Unjust Judges. And he says in verse number verse number 2, he says, How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Verses 3 and 4, Defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. And some of the testimonies in America is a poor person can't get a, a fair shake because the judicial system's a challenge. How do I get a good lawyer? All those kinds of things. But even beyond that, being, being poor tends to be problematic and lots of ripple effects of that. Hey, we ought to be, we ought to be generous. We ought to be caring for, for poor folks. Again, why, why, do we, why do we minister to folks that have less than us? Because everybody needs the gospel. Next time. There's one more on this page. And then a challenge of being rich, that same set of, of a section of Scripture. And again, for time's sake, I'm not going to read all of that. First Timothy chapter 6, a place I do want to go. 1 Timothy 6, verse 9, that says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and into a snare, and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in perdition. Verse 10 goes on to say, For the love of money is the root of all evil. 
money can be seductive. Money can be problematic. I mean, we can chase after things and chase after stuff. And it's amazing, the more stuff we have, the more money it costs us. We live in an America, and I, I said this one time, and somebody thought, I, I get that actually sold storage units and said, You're, are you busting on storage units? No. C can you imagine, do, do you think, I, I should ask Pastor this, are there any storage units in Kenya where the Maasai, they got so much stuff that won't fit in their house, they put it in a storage unit? And I've got stuff in a storage unit for, for a different reason, like for, for job situation. I'll even use your house. Does anybody have a storage place at your house where you just got stuff, you just keep it, just have it? Oh, yeah, and it's, I mean, it's a matter of, and again, I'm not against things, but things cost, you know, if you, if you have lots of cars, you know, what, you know what they want you to do is put insurance on your cars. Why am I putting insurance on a car? I don't want to have a wreck anyway. The more stuff we have, the more cost. How many folks pay property tax? Anybody pay property tax? Anybody not pay property tax? We'll turn you in. I got some people here who can turn you in. Um, the more stuff you have, the more you pay. So being rich costs you money. Yeah, God's attitude about riches are use them for him. I, again, God's riches given to us are opportunities for us to make a difference. Just as God gives singing talent or preaching talent or teaching talent or the gifts that pastors talked about, the spiritual gifts of various kinds. Hey, we as Americans are blessed. It is a blessing to be able to give money to go around the world. And it's incredible some of the things that can happen around the world with money that frankly would disappear in the United States just because of the, the value systems and again, the availabilities of things. Next page, if we could. And so respect in the last, last part of the chapter, uh, James chapter 2, um, we're going to hit some highlights here. God is not a fan of disrespect. Verse number 7, he says, do, they not, do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you're called? And that in Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, has some sad friends of blasphemy. Ra anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filth, communication. When, when we shake our fists in prejudice, we are shaking our fists sadly at the, at the Savior. Next slide. We ought not be there. And so he goes, James goes on to say, but if you fulfill the royal law, which is an interesting term, I encourage you to do a study that, according to Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself, ye do well. And why is that? I call it the second commandment. You go to Matthew 22, Mark chapter 12, and you'll find Jesus make that same statement when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said the first is about loving God, and then the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And, and what does that mean? Paul puts it in a different perspective in Ephesians chapter 5, talking about men and, and, and women, husband and wife. And he says in Ephesians 5, 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. Do we really love people like we love us? Man, that's hard. Because we draw, I'm, are you willing to pick up the person walking in the rain that's soaking wet and get into your nice car that you just detailed? And again, I'm not here to, to guilt people or anything else, but it's a matter of do what God have you to do. I mean, we've had people in our church that have adopted people that have different kind of disabilities and issues and things. Hey, amen to you. Do that. Just make sure we don't put limits on God and say, God, I will never do X. I will never, I will never work here. I will never do this thing. Hey, let's make sure. Loving people's hard because people are unlovely. I know because I is one. There's time. It, I know it's hard to believe. There's sometimes I'm not very nice. Why are you guys laughing? That kind of hurt my feelings. Anyhow, next item. And the challenge that comes from playing favorites, verse number nine, but if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. In fact, that, that word of, of, of convinced of the law, 2 Timothy 3, 16, calls it reproof. All scripture given by inspiration of God, proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. God doesn't want us to play favorites. Again, I'm, I'm in here... And are there certain people I like better than other people? Yeah, because my wife's in the class. Do I treat everybody like I treat my wife? No. I can tolerate that little baby that was crying because I think there's some, like, relative relationship there. So I'll cut that baby some slack. But if your baby cries, you're, get out of here. Anyhow, just kidding there. Don't play favorites. Again, if somebody wants to come up and get saved, hey, well, I'm glad for any. I don't care. Again, male, female, tall, short. You live in Harrison County, Lewis County, Upshur County. I don't care if you live in Texas. I don't care where you live. Hey, if we're, if we're trying, we play favorites, we got a problem. God, God's going to hammer us for that. Next item. And I call it God's commandments are not a buffet. You might say, what does that mean? Well, verses 10 and 11 talk about whosoever should keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. What a brutal statement. Now, and God's not saying hey, that, that murder is as bad as shoplifting a piece of gum. I recognize that. The, the challenge of that verse is both of those will exempt you from heaven. 
Sin in itself is the problem. Verse number 11 says, For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. God's point is, hey, sin is bad. We don't just pick the commandments we like. Romans 14, 23 raises that bar. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Hebrews 4, 12, that talks about the Word of God that, that even understands the thoughts and intents of our heart. God wants our actions to be right, our thoughts to be right, our words to be right. We shouldn't just pick and choose and say, well, my sin's okay, but somebody else's is bad. It's, it's again, it's the, I've heard the lament, the worst people against smokers are ex-smokers. I shouldn't pick against a sin because I just don't like that one. Again, I get appalled by some of the things in America that are called righteousness. But if, if me being appalled about the sins that Americans commit that are called okay and not against my own bitterness and laziness and, and critical nature, hey, shame on me. Sin is sin. We ought to treat it that way. Next item. And then the last one about the power of mercy over judgment. I encourage you to do a study about judgment. We live in an America where don't judge anybody. And, and I've, I've joked about this. I can't imagine. I, I, I tend to go over the speed limit on occasion. I cannot imagine a policeman pulling me over for speeding and me saying, well, you know, judge not lest you be judged. Or saying this, well, Mr. Policeman, I didn't run any stoplights, did I? Nope. I didn't run any stop signs, did I? Nope. I didn't hit anybody, did I? Nope. We should let me go. And that's not the way it works. Mercy over judgment is can, can get into the exercising of it. I mean, to me, the two passages I'd put together, Galatians 5, 1 and 6, 1. Galatians 5, 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Some people will say, well, we ought not, we ought not care about somebody else's sin. We ought to just love them anyway. And we should love people. But loving people in sin and leaving them in sin is akin to telling somebody, hey, you got cancer. We're not going to do anything about it. We're not going to try to help you. No. Hey, you got a flat tire, and I love you with your flat tire. Well, could you help me? Could you help me jack up the car? Well, no. I'm gonna leave you with the flat tire. Cause I want to love you in your flat tire. Well, <laughs> Galatians six one, challenging verse. Brethren, be not overtaken in a fault. If I'm sorry, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, lest thou also be tempted. We need to help people. Again, it's not judging to say, hey, if you got a problem with sin, we need to help you get out of that. We need to move forward. There's a consequence of sin, sadly the case. I don't let God deal with the consequence, but hey, we need to help. We need to hate sin and not have people live there. So next page, we're going to build out the last page. I know I'm, I'm over time, a couple minutes. Three simple questions to ask. What prejudices do I have? Am I against women? Am I against blacks? Am I against Hispanics? Am I against, am I against you know, the government? Do I, do I not like somebody just because of a characteristic? There are no good prejudices. Again, I, I say that flippantly, but seriously, I'm against anybody that Jesus didn't die for. And I found out that Jesus died for Democrats and Republicans. Jesus died for blacks and whites. Jesus died for men and women, young and old. The one point, what do I, one point do I need today to, to deal with? Is that scripture that talks about if we offend in one point? Is there a sin that busts on me that I need to get past? Is it laziness? Is it bitterness? Is it I'm too, I'm too busy to read the Bible? I'm too busy to pray for people? I'm too busy to give to missions? I'm too, too whatever? And what am I doing to replace judgment with mercy? Judgment is easy. Mercy is helping people pass that. Again, mercy is not an excuse for sin. It is not say it just we, we ignore it and treat it like the traditional grandpa ignores what grandchild does. Mercy says, I'm going to help you get past it. We're going to deal with sin and we're going to move past that. What are we doing to help? Hard place to get to. Some people don't want help. Some people get mad at you giving help. But what would Jesus Christ do? Jesus Christ came, died on the cross that he might get people out of sin. We need to help people the same way. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we love you. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for the challenge. Lord, help us to be folks that care about people, uh, be they tall, short, fat, thin, old, young, smart, um, not so smart, rich, poor. Lord, we pray for your power uh, to make a difference. Lord, help us to be godly folks, to be obedient to your spirit. We pray it help us to hate sin. Lord, reveal that which hinders your work in our lives. And Lord, especially though, if there's one here that needs Christ, we pray that today be the day of salvation. Lord, we love you and we need you. Bless the service to follow. Help us to honor you, we pray in Christ's name.